In 80 days, adventurer and award-winning filmmaker Paul G. Roberts retraces the global footsteps of Phileas Fogg, hero of Jules Verne's most famous work. Were the pyramids built with the help of alien intelligence? Are they celestial gateways to alternative dimensions, gazillions of light years away? Or are they just rocks, big rocks, stacked upon each other, one on top of the other, built off the back of the blood and sweat of ordinary Egyptian workers and slaves? Now, having seen the pyramids of Giza up close, I'm scratching my head trying to figure out how ancient humans could actually have built such a thing without computers or machinery. It's just mind boggling.
There's something so uniquely fascinating about the ancient Egyptians that's captivated historians, archaeologists, and members of the public like myself for nearly 300 years. And it's easy to see why. From this strange form of writing called hieroglyphics to the mysterious Sphinx and the macabre mummies of the Great Pyramid, ancient Egypt was an enigmatic land that attracted ancient Roman leaders, their militaries, to Egyptian seaports, and as well as British Egyptologists to its dusty temples and tombs. Much of our understanding of ancient cultures can actually be attributed to the ancient Egyptians who left us many texts and treasures, monuments and myths that offer us tantalizing clues about the exotic and wondrous world of ancient Egypt. Now we all know Egypt is a very old place. It dates back to 5500 BC and historians divide ancient Egypt into three parts or three thirds. There's the Old Kingdom, the Middle Kingdom and the New Kingdom. In ancient times, the people of Egypt used to use the reigns of certain rulers as date markers, making it difficult for today's archaeologists to definitively date structures and monuments. But the Egyptians kept a record of their kings or pharaohs that scholars once deciphered, once that unlocked the key to translating the writing system of the ancient Egyptians. In ancient time and today, life in Egypt depends very much on the Nile River. The Nile starts off somewhere south of the equator and flows all the way to the 31st degree latitude, passing over one third of the northern hemisphere. Over this length, the Nile drains an area of over 3,200,000 square kilometers, representing 10% of the entire African continent. Considering these vast distances, it is no surprise that different sections of the Nile experience vastly different climates and topographies. The White Nile starts off in a tropical wet savanna region, giving it a constant flow of water year-round. New tributaries and evaporation keep the water levels in balance until its confluence with the Blue Nile in the center of Sudan's capital, Khartoum. The Blue Nile and many of its tributaries originate in the Ethiopian highlands, which experience extreme seasonal variety in precipitation. 
During the wet season between May and August, they contribute over 70% of the entire discharge of the Nile, with a volume of over 5,600 cubic meters per second. The dry season, on the other hand, can see a flow of as little as 2% compared to the peak, and in extreme cases can even dry out completely. That life-sustaining body of water that flows south to north, cutting through the inhospitable desert sands of the Sahara. The Nile is prone to seasonal flooding, which makes the land either side of it fertile and good for growing crops, ideal for agriculture. But it's a delicate balance because if the Nile floods too much, it can destroy all the farms and the crops. And if it doesn't flood, the crops could wither and die, causing famine and starvation. Now the rich lands of the Nile first led nomadic people to put down permanent ag agricultural settlements in ancient Egypt. And as these settlements grew, trade and commerce began. Class structures arose and artists and craftsmen flourished. Interaction between the different settlements became more frequent as the people of ancient Egypt moved closer to establish a unified kingdom. And the climate of ancient Egypt was also changing. Around 3600 BC, the lands further away from the Nile were becoming drier and hotter, forcing more people to move to the banks of the Nile. The influx of people pushed the limits of the region's food producing capabilities. And as neighboring communities competed for resources, leaders offered the construction of walls and other defense tactics. Three main kingdoms formed and they battled each other for food and trade goods and for precious stones and gold. After years of competition, one kingdom rose as the most powerful of the three and its ruler, King Nama, put an end to the conflicts and united the three kingdoms together in 2950 BC, making him the first true ruler of Egypt and the founder of the very first nation state in history. Under King Nama, Egypt gained its cultural and national identity. He established a governmental system, creating icons of royalty such as the crown, and he ordered the construction of large and ornate buildings as a show of importance of the royal family. During King Nama's reign or shortly after, a system of writing was created in ancient Egypt. The written language became known as a form of record keeping for commerce, but quickly developed into a way for royal scribes to keep track and titles of their rulers and their lineage and key events. Hieroglyphics allowed them to immortalize their kings in history. Egyptian kings or pharaohs were all powerful in Egyptian society. Pharaohs were viewed as the earthy embodiment of Horus, the link between humans and the gods. And when a ruler took the throne, he was immediately given divine status. And he had a role, a dual role, of appeasing the gods and keeping his human subjects safe, productive and healthy. Times of drought, disease, famine, or war, according to the ancient Egyptians, did not happen by natural causes, but because the gods were displeased, and also displeased with the pharaoh, and he was being punished. The priests of ancient Rome were only second to the pharaohs in power, although they did not have a direct line of communication with the gods like the pharaohs, they were tasked with aiding the pharaoh in keeping the gods happy and the citizens thriving. Priests could become wealthy in ancient Egypt, primarily through the gifts they were given by
by the wealthy people who wanted to put in a good word with both the gods and the pharaoh. Any discussion of ancient Egypt could not be complete without addressing the two biggest landmarks in Egypt, and that's the Great Pyramid of Giza and the Sphinx, which are actually quite close to each other. The whole settlement of Giza is really just on the outskirts of Cairo. It's quite bizarre. When I remember when I first went there, I caught a taxi and it was literally 20, 30 minutes from the hotel I was staying at. And you have the mass urban sprawl of, of Cairo, which is quite manic and crazy. And then immediately you come to the little border and it's the Sahara Desert. On one side, there's the sand. And if you turn the camera around the other way behind you, it's full <laughs> Cairo madness. It's crazy. The Great Pyramid uh, is also called the Pyramid of Khufu, and the fourth dynasty pharaoh who ordered its construction was his name. It's the oldest of the three pyramids in the Giza complex. There's Cheops and Chephren as well, and they date back 2,560 years BC. These structures may seem to some as just huge piles of rock. With modern machinery, like cranes, it may be easy to take for granted the monumental task of moving and lifting this much material. So let's put this problem in context to understand why it has baffled historians for centuries. The largest of the Great Pyramids, Pyramid Khufu, was the tallest man-made structure on Earth for almost 4,000 years. Pyramid Khufu contains over 2.3 million limestone blocks, each weighing an average of 2.5 tons, which form the interior structure of the pyramid and an additional 200,000 blocks were used for the smooth white stone casing, which now only exists on the upper cap. But the pyramids aren't simply giant piles of limestone arranged nicely. Pyramid Khufu, incredibly, contains massive interior chambers like the King's Chamber, which is supported by massive granite beams with the heaviest weighing about 40 tons, 
That's about the same as the maximum allowable weight of a fully laden articulated truck. These stones are located between 43 meters and 65 meters up the pyramid. Just transporting the massive stones to the site from the quarries was a massive undertaking, but other civilizations that predate the Egyptians have achieved similar feats like Stonehenge or the even more ancient Irish building of Newgrange. The limestone for the pyramids was quarried nearby, much of it quarried directly next to the pyramids, while the granite was likely taken from Aswan and transported to the site on boats. We know from hieroglyphs that the Egyptians used wooden sleds to transport heavy objects while workers lubricated its movement with water. This was simply a problem of manpower which the wealthy Egyptian empire was not short on. What has fascinated me is the logistic challenge of building a structure like this. The sequence of events and mechanisms that these ancient engineers used to lift these immense weights into place are a mystery. A mystery that many have tried to solve but many theories come up short. To solve this riddle, let's start with what we do know. First things first. Unless the pyramids were truly built by aliens with anti-gravity machines, the pyramids were built from the bottom up. Next, because of the precise geometric shape of the pyramids, with each side of the Great Pyramid being 230.3 meters long, with the largest difference in length between the northern and southern edge at only 4.4 centimeters. This level of accuracy could only have been possible if the external casing stones were laid first, allowing deviations to be caught early and corrected before the internal structure was filled in. This makes any theories for external ramps or cranes unlikely, as they would have been extremely difficult to attach to the smooth external wall, which was inclined at 52 degrees. Instead, the most prevalent theory suggests a ramp on one side of the pyramid that would raise with the pyramid, but this has its limit. When pulling a weight like this uphill, the force required is given by this equation. The average mass of blocks was 2.5 tons, or about 24,500 newtons. There were heavier blocks, but these were mainly used in the lower levels. Let's set our slope angle alpha at 7 degrees, and the coefficient of friction between two pieces of wet wood is about 0.1. Using these figures, we can calculate the force needed to pull this weight uphill at about 5,418 newtons. Modern safety guidelines say the maximum any worker should pull is 225 newtons, but since this is a prolonged track and stopping is not an option, most calculate the max each worker would pull at 150 newtons, or about 15.3 kilograms. So that means around 36 workers would be needed to haul this weight. This figure is reasonable, but for every additional degree of slope, at least an extra three workers will be needed, which would soon become extremely impractical. The other option of simply elongating the ramp and maintaining the angle is completely unfeasible, as constructing the ramp would be a bigger project than the Great Pyramid itself. Like any modern construction project, these are logistical issues the Egyptians would have had to overcome. This is the core of engineering, trying to solve problems with the tools at hand, and now we have to reverse engineer this problem without knowing exactly what tools the Egyptians had. One of the most convincing theories I have seen from French architect Jean-Pierre Houdin may hold the truth for the pyramid's construction. Jean-Pierre theorized that this external ramp was used to construct up to the height of the king's chamber at around 43 meters, allowing the heaviest granite stones used to be hauled up this ramp. Granite has often been used in grand historic buildings for its superior compressive strength, allowing the buildings to grow in size. Here, the granite was tasked with supporting the immense weight of the pyramid above the king's chamber. At this height, the majority of the volume of the pyramid is completed, but we still need a way of transporting those final blocks into place. This is where the innovative part of Jean-Pierre's theory comes in. He proposes that while the first 43 meters was being constructed, the workers also built an internal ramp, which would transport material recycled from the exterior ramp to the top of the pyramid. Now this theory should be easy to prove. The interior ramp should still exist, but the pyramid is a protected structure. You can't simply take it apart and see what's inside but we do have tools that can peer inside the internal structure without damaging it. One team used microgravimetry in 1986 to measure the density of different sections of the pyramid. This research produced this image, showing a strange pattern where the green indicates lower density, which closely matches the pattern of Jean-Pierre's predicted internal ramp. They developed a new form of measurement called the qubit. It was used to design massive structures, such as the Great Pyramid, with remarkable geometrical precision. The structure, for anyone that's ever seen it in person, or even in a photo, is a marvel of ancient engineering and construction. Thought to be a tomb, the Great Pyramid was the crowning achievement of Egypt's pyramid builders, who actually built 80 pyramids in total. And equally impressive, or not as big, is the more and more mysterious, is the great animal man thing, the, the Sphinx which is also on the Giza Plateau. 
The enormous statue of this mythical creature, who is half human and half lion, is often attributed to the pharaoh Khafra, putting its construction at roughly 2494 BC. Some historians and archaeologists point to or theorize that the Sphinx may be much older. We do know that at various points in history, the Great Sphinx was nearly swallowed up by the desert and buried up to its neck in the shifting sands of the Sahara and had to be dug out. The enigmatic Sphinx, along with the Great Pyramid of Giza, a symbol of Egypt, recognized all around the world. Pharaohs that reigned in the New Kingdom between 1570 and 1070 BC wielded more power and command than any rulers who preceded them. They were the rulers who extended Egypt's land holdings, built ambitious temples and monuments, and established foreign diplomacy with surrounding nations. In the 20 years he ruled, Pharaoh Tutmos III built Egypt into a phenomenal empire through decisive military victories, which are chronicled in Karnak's Hall of Annals. Another of Egypt's New Kingdom pharaohs, Ankartigan, is best remembered for being the ruler who tried to change the role of religious worship in ancient Europe. Before Ankartinan's reign, Egyptians worshipped a pantheon of gods and deities, in much the same way that the ancient Greeks did, Romans and Norse. Ankhetaten, however, forced the citizen into monotheism and only one supreme god, a sun deity. The people of ancient Egypt naturally balked at this sudden change and radical shift in their religious practices, although few spoke out about the pharaoh. But after his death, polytheism was restored and statues and monuments to Ankhetaten were destroyed or dismantled, and his name was even expunged from the, the history of records of the kings. The beautiful queen Nefertiti was married to Ankhetaten, but not much else is known about her. Queens only ruled in partnership with their kings. However, historians believe that Nefertiti may have served as the sole ruler of her people after her husband's death and before the boy pharaoh, Tutankhamun, began his reign. We may not know much about Nefertiti's background, but we do know what she looked like. A bust of her likeness, believed to have been sculpted in 34, 1345 BC, was unearthed in an artist's work by a German archaeologist in 1912. The bust of Nefertiti, often called the most beautiful woman in all the world, is on display at a museum in Berlin. Upon the death of Archentaten, there was no clear heir to assume the throne. The only appropriate person was Tutankhamun, a seven-year-old child. The boy pharaoh, as he later became known, became a household name after his treasure-laden, nearly intact tomb was discovered in the Valley of Kings in 1922 by British archeologist Howard Carter, and besides the priceless treasures, ornate sarcophagus, and mummified remains of the pharaoh, the tomb held back a curse. And you've all seen this in the movies, The Mummy, etc. If the legends are to be believed, that caused the strange and unexpected deaths of Carter and several members of his archaeological team. The mystery of the curse, along with the trove of valuable artefacts, made it a fascinating story, leading to King Tut's immense fame, appearing in everything from Brendan Fraser's The Mummy to even Batman. Let it be a warning, loyal subjects. Our enemies shall be reduced, even as these, to mindless slaves. Smash open their cases. Dance, you slaves. 
Dance for our amusement. The discovery of King Tut's tomb and the worldwide attention it garnered put Egyptian unique funeral and burial practices into the spotlight. In the mythology and religion of ancient Egypt, the belief in the afterlife was of high importance. Pharaohs and nobles spent their lives preparing for their deaths and tried to ensure they would enjoy a comfortable afterlife. A key component of this was the preservation of the corpses. The people of ancient Egypt developed effective embalming and mummification techniques, including wrapping the deceased in strips of cloth that took advantage of the dry desert climate to keep the body intact. The funeral rituals of the ancient Egyptians guaranteed that the deceased had a safe journey to the afterworld. Some pharaohs were buried with boats so they could transport him to the great beyond. Servants and family members were also buried with the pharaoh so they could serve him in the afterlife. All the worldly objects he may need were added to the tomb, including items of great monetary value and things that favoured the gods. The walls of the tombs themselves were lined with prayers and spells meant to protect the dead and the tombs were hidden and secured from tomb robbers so they couldn't find them and steal the precious artifacts held within. Towards the end of the Egyptian empire, Egypt became an integral part of the political and economic activities of the Mediterranean Sea. Roman and Greek leaders, scholars and philosophers regularly interacted with the Egyptians, which influenced the Egyptian culture. Some of the interactions became personally and politically entangled. Such was the case with Cleopatra, the daughter of Ptolemy VII. A weak and ineffective leader, Ptolemy VII often called on Rome for military and political support. And upon his death, the throne passed to Ptolemy VIII, who was just a child. Therefore, the elder Ptolemy's daughter, Cleopatra, 
was married to the younger Ptolemy, and she took control of the country in the interim. When he grew older, the two rulers battled each other for control until Julius Caesar and his army arrived in Alexandria to negotiate a truce between them. And struck by her beauty and charm, Caesar and Cleopatra became lovers, and he fathered her child. After Caesar's murder, Cleopatra began a relationship with another prominent Roman, Mark Antony. To save his empire and himself, I must from this enchanting queen break off. Him. And the couple had three children together. But their relationship was torn apart by war. And in a true life Romeo and Juliet scenario, Cleopatra hid in a tomb and sent word to Mark Antony that she was dead. Upon hearing the news, the distraught Mark Antony tried to kill himself. And as he lay dying, he was told of the mix-up and that his lover was still alive. He ordered his men to take him to Cleopatra and he died in her arms. So sad. Devastated by losing her love, Cleopatra allowed an asp to bite her and she too died. It was a poetic, Shakespearean, Romeo and Juliet ending. Thanks to the stories like that of Mark Antony and Cleopatra, the cursed tomb of King Tut, the mysterious Sphinx and the cryptic hieroglyphics, the culture of ancient Egypt has inspired wonder and awe for 300 years. From the desert sands of northern Africa, a complex, mysterious and fascinating civilization arose that is the subject of study and research to this day. Unlike any other culture on earth, the Egyptians accomplished amazing feats of engineering and pioneered the idea of a national identity, all against the backdrop of the enigmatic pyramids.